Okay, so the next topic up for uh, our agenda is uh, the new advanced cooling subproject up under rack of cooling, uh, rack of power rather. Um, so as uh, we kind of showed before, this is a brand new subproject. We're essentially uh, this will be the first discussions that we have related to this uh, project group. Um, so this is a, a, a line that I pulled out of the uh, scope for this project that, that Bill wrote. Um, and it shows that the subproject is going to be focused on the critical interfaces, operational parameters, and environmental conditions for these products in order to enable a non-proprietary multi-vendor supply chain for warm water cooling. Okay, so as far as, as the foundation concern, right, this is the focus of what this project is going to be um, spending its time and energies on. Let me give a little bit of background. Yeah, so for the last year, we've heard um, a lot of our community members uh, bring up the topic of, um, you know, liquid cooling. Mm -hmm. And, um, and you know, the, one of the questions that we ask ourselves is, um, is there a problem here um, and does that problem, can that problem be solved um, through collaboration? And um, so obviously, um, you know, liquid cooling, whether it's immersion uh, or uh, direct cold plate, um, is, you know, pretty well understood today, but it hasn't had um, a lot of adoption in um, cloud computing. And, um, you know, some of the feedback that we've gotten is that, um, because there's no harmonization of the solution, that it has prevented adoption by cloud providers. And um, the, the solution tends to be a, a boutique solution that uh, doesn't necessarily scale. And so that answered the question as to whether or not there was some advantage in collaboration. Collaboration from adopters, whether it's you know a, you know, a couple of hyperscale accounts or, or uh, you know whether it's you know, smaller regional cloud providers or even uh, enterprise class um, companies that operate a, a private cloud environment. Um, you know, there was, it, it appeared as though there's opportunities uh, that w if we collaborated, we could come up with some uh, common solutions that um, would have, a, um, you know, better alignment and um, more potential for um, adoption and a better supply chain. Um, we also heard from the supply network that said they'd like to um, be a part of the solution, but um, they have no idea, you know, which solution to align with. So if you look at, you know, cold plate technology, there's, gosh, at least a half, you know, a dozen, I'm sorry, about a dozen solutions out there. Um, and so the ODMs have said, well, gosh, you know, pick one so I know how to design for it, right, or design to it. Um, and, and so we've heard the same feedback. Um, recently, I was talking with the, the team at Rittal, and, and they said, gosh, we'd love to provide a rack, you know, for liquid cooling, but again, you know, have no idea, um, you know, what, what that rack would look like and, and how I would align to, to that solution. So again, it was just confirmation that through collaboration um, that we have this, an opportunity to kind of accelerate adoption of, of advanced cooling. Um, and so at the same time, we had um, had this on our radar screen, had discussions, strategic discussions with our board, um, and uh, through all these discussions with board, with the community, um, with the supply chain, that it made sense to, to go ahead and launch that this, um, this last month. So that was a little bit of background on that. Um, let's grab the next slide. Yeah. Um, Yeah, so, um, you know, are we going to try to pick one of those? Um, the answer is no. Um, so as a foundation, we're not, you know, we're not trying to design the solution. Um, we just want to bring people together and put all the smart people in one room to, to figure this out. So it looks like there's three um, kind of distinct types of solutions. You have a, a cold plate type of solution, an immersion type, and then a... Um, a third category, I'll call it compressed air. I, I think it's probably compressed air. It could be something else. But um, clearly, you know, suppliers uh, and adopters that are in 
have interest in all three of those, and so we'd like to do is is you know put put you together, and um, and come up with um, you know recommendations or guidelines, and in some cases it may actually uh, be a specification. You could choose to work with a supplier and and prototyping that. Um, and the idea is that we're you know matching the demand and the requirements from our um, our adopter community with the capability of our supply community. So we envision that there's actually going to be um, three separate types of work groups, and so you may choose to participate in all three or, or just participate in one of those. Um, this is just looking at the scope of the chart. Yeah. Next one's the second half of it, what's in, in out of scope. Basically. Yeah. So. Um, so th when we start off on a project, we try to uh, create a, a, a charter document. Um, and just for the purposes of, of um, you know, a starting point, this is something I authored, um, and I'll turn it over to, you know, whoever runs the project, you know, from here on out. Um, but the notion is, is that there's opportunities to harmonize the solution. Um, and so, um, you know, this is just my initial thought on, on how we do that. Um, you know, I think there's, there's opportunities to look at, um, you know, the, the physical characteristics and as there are opportunities to harmonize on that, um, the parameters in which, uh, you know, these solutions work. So think about, uh, just again, just as an example, um, on, on cold plate technology, you have a manifold on the back of your rack and you have, you know, IT equipment. Uh, think about being able to define how much heat is extracted. Um, you know, what uh, parameters around water temperatures, around volume, around, uh, you know, characteristics of materials, um, you know, to avoid materials that are, you know, corrosive. Think about the sustainability down the road, separation of materials as that, as that um, piece of equipment gets recycled. Um, you know, maybe, it, uh, maybe there's opportunities to, uh, you know, define some common parts around, uh, you know, dripless connectors or, or so on. So... Um, you know, to the degree that we can, you know, reach commonality around these specifications and use cases and, and, uh, and, and environmental conditions, we have an opportunity to align on those solutions. Similarly, uh, there's a set of characteristics around immersion that would apply as well as compressed air. So, again, this is kind of what I envision the work group would be able to tackle. And again, it may result in, in a set of guidelines. Uh, similar to what the data center facilities group uh, created when they created their um, uh, guidelines for adoption of, of OCP uh, gear into a colo. Uh, it could re end up in a spec, um, and it could end up as a you know, reference design or, or, or products that support the, those guidelines. So again, there's lots of degrees of freedom there. Um, with that, I'll let the work groups um, you know, kind of go in that direction. Um, there, there is another, you know, type of liquid cooling solution that's, um, you know, rear door chillers where you're actually doing a, a water to air and then using air, traditional air cooling. And so um, I think, again, that's pretty well understood. There's no, there's no need to collaborate to, to make improvements in that. So that's um, considered out of scope. And then, um, you know, where do we get started? So... The first thing to do is to build a community. So let me just pause right there and, and you know, try to answer some questions if there's any. Do you guys have any questions about what we're doing, why we're doing it? So what is the typical wattage level at which this advanced cooling kick in or like what's the threshold? Like is it 3K or how, how does it get distributed? Well, good question. Um, so... Um, there's, you know, you heard discussions earlier around, you know, at what point does air cooling become um, ineffective? And, you know, maybe it's in that, you know, say 30 to 50K range, kilowatt range. Um, the, and I think generally that's a, a, the right answer for North America. Um, but there's a lot of geographies of the world where, um, you know, using air cooling is, um, you know, is, is relatively expensive. Um, and so, you know, particularly in, um, let's say, Singapore, uh, you know, in Japan in the summer, um, you know, South Korea, um, some regions, some cities, geographies within China, 
um, you know those um, you know those parts of the world that where you have high humidity, um, you know high outside temperatures, um, difficult to cool efficiently, cost effectively, um, and so that you know having an alternative of you know using liquid to remove heat and then using a warm water loop um, and a and the potential to use a dry cooler in your facilities. Um, is much more cost effective. And so I think there's scenarios where, um, you know, a, a lo much lower powered rack um, may be more cost effective to cool with water, and specifically with warm water. So there, I don't think there's, you know, one answer, right? At least in, in my mind there isn't, and, and I think I'd leave it up to the group to define, you know, some guidelines around that when it makes sense. Um, so there's also another um, trend in the industry, and that's the adoption of, uh, you know, GPUs. And um, uh, it was interesting, I had a, a, an interview, thank you, Dirk. Uh, I had a, a media interview yesterday scheduled for 30 minutes, it lasted 90. Um, anyway, it was, it was talk about the formation of this group, and, uh, um, and, and the, the person was 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 saying how it's it's appropriate for us to get into this given you know the adoption of GPUs, so we started talking through it and and if you look at at the GPUs today you can put you know eight Teslas on on one uh, planer and uh, you know those are 250 watts a piece so you have 2,000 watts on a board, um, you know nominally the height of that board is um, you know less than an inch. Um, and so you can put that in a, easily put that in a 1U uh, system. Um, so, you know, now we're, we're talking about, you know, really extreme, you know, power densities. Um, you know, the, the, the 8 GPU on a planer is a, is a limitation, as I understand, a limitation of the software. And in the future, it's possible that we'll start to see those limitations, um, you know, broken down and we could see you know, the number of GPUs on a board scale up from there. Um, so, I mean, I can envision how you, we could see, you know, 16 or 32 GPUs on a single planer. Um, from, you know, from a layout perspective, it's, you know, there's plenty of room on the board to do that. We can deliver the power and the cooling to, to achieve that. And those high power density um, configurations, um, I don't know that you have an option to, to uh, air cool. Um, the preheat, you know, just normal airflow would preheat the back processors, you never cool them. So having some type of immersion cooling would, you know, likely make sense or, or a cold plate technology. So there's a case where, you know, just the, the obvious trend in adoption GPUs will drive us to um, using some type of advanced cooling. And given the scale of, of that adoption, you know, I think as an industry we need to be ready for that and ready in the sense of having a cost-effective, scalable solution. So, it's probably a long answer to a simple question, <laughs> but yeah. So what are the guidelines? Are you keeping the server architecture the same <coughs> as it is today for air cooling? <coughs> so the, the question was, are we, are we keeping the server architecture the same? Um, um, I don't, you know, that's really up to the community. It's up to the folks that want to work on this. I'll, 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 I'll give you an example where it may make sense to not keep it the same. Um, so if you look today at immersion, you'll, a lot of times you'll see a, like a 1U or 2U system that's, you know, turned on, on its end and dunked into the tank. So if you have a, a two-u system, it's three and a half inches wide, so you're nominally on a, a four-inch pitch. Um, think about the actual planer in that. The planer's, you know, the planer in the heat sink or planer in the, the silicon and, and uh, you know, memory would be about an inch. So if you could just get rid of all the sheet metal around it and just drop the planer in to the bath, you'd be on a one-inch pitch versus a four inch pitch. So you could get four times the, the density. So, I mean, I can see how changing the form factor, um, you know, would make sense. If you can achieve 
you know, cooling of, let's say, a, a 2,000 or 3,000 watt board, um, you know, on, on one planer, then, you know, maybe it makes sense to put more components on it. So I think that there's options to be able to, um, you know, change the form factor. Um, but certainly, you know, without actually changing the form factor, just simply stripping away the chassis, right, and getting down to the, 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 the planer. Yeah, I, I I would agree. Yeah. Well, so you know the the, the issue is you know with anything, right? If you, dr you take something out of out of liquid or you disconnect something, there's you know there, there's that potential. I think the issue is how do we how do we feel comfortable, you know, doing that, you know. You know, if you're circulating water, you know, a few drops of water here and there's, a, you know, the loss of that is not a cost impact. If you're circulating, you know, a fluorinite, fluorine material, you know, the cost of that's substantial. So, yeah. But again, I think those are all the great questions. Um, you know, I'm convinced that, you know, put the right people together, uh, we'll come up with, uh, they'll come up with solutions and guidelines for that. Yeah. Uh, I, th I think two points. One is uh, today we see these GPUs at 250 watts. I'm, I'm sure uh, we're seeing silicon that's o over uh, 600 watts now. So that this continuing trend of GPUs needing more and more power will drive the requirements for this. Mm -hmm. uh, the other area, I don't know if it applies here or not, edge data centers where you have more con constrained space and where you have a, a much more difficult thermal load as these uh, things kind of move to the edge in these more confined data centers, that it may become more important too. So I, I think it's a very important trend. Yeah, that's, a, that's actually a really good comment. I spent some time talking about that. Um, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. In the edge, we, you know, we're in, in locations where um, you know, adding more cooling capacity is, um, you know, prohibitive. And so, you know, plumbing in um, a warm water loop and putting a dry cooler, you know, outside somewhere is a, you know, a lot easier than trying to, you know, change the airflow in a building. And, and so, you know, that, that's uh, looking at kind of traditional IT. When you get into high power densities, like you say, when we start to move um, those applications to the edge, uh, you know, latency sensitive, we're doing uh, inference on the edge uh, with GPUs and FPGAs that, you know, no doubt we'll see, um, you know, power densities, um, you know, that are, that are beyond the capability that we have in those data centers, those facilities that so we'll have to do something. So that's a, by the way, I think the edge is a, is a whole nother challenge in terms of, of, of what's the correct architecture mechanically and, and power delivery wise. I hope that we can leverage what we're doing with open rack and, and some of these other standards and and leverage some of the components, but I think that's a you know, that's a space that we have to you know look at immediately. I hope that the work that's done by this group is you know can be applied there as well. Absolutely. So I know this is an emerging technology, but is there any um, you know entry level solutions for these things commercially available, or is it just a still an exploration stage. Wow, um, I think that there's a lot of, of solutions today um, for for liquid cooling, uh, for for uh, cold plate technology. You know, um, you heard a gentleman this morning talk about uh, power densities and and uh, Penguin Computing how they use uh, liquid to cool the racks. Um, so again, that's technology that's been around and been available. Um, you know, I think there's opportunities to harmonize that. Um, and so we don't have, you know, let's say a dozen different suppliers or dozen different um, integrators that are putting that together. Um, and I think it, it actually, um, you know, provides 
um, some value and opportunity to, to those solution providers, those integrators, if they had, you know, standard components they could use or, or could leverage, um, you know, ODMs that were building, let's say, standard build on building blocks. So um, I, I don't, you know, I think it, it's advantageous to, um, to those, the companies that are building those types of solutions. Same, same with the immersion as well. So if no other questions, so the real, the real question is, you know, who's interested in being a part of this? Um, do you want to be a part of one or, or all three? Or um, is there anyone that's, that's very passionate about it that wants to step up and lead this effort? Uh, we're looking for volunteer leaders that'll, you know, run these, these project teams. Um, uh, Archon and I have a list of companies and names that, of people already interested in participating. Um, we just spent a week in, in Asia and um, we have a, probably a half a dozen companies that are interested in participating there. We had a, a meetup like this in Japan. We had 140 people in attendance. Um, a large portion of those folks were very interested in uh, participation and collaboration on advanced cooling. Um, so we, we're building a portfolio of, of community members that are interested. Um, I think this is probably the one time we haven't started here in the U.S. So <laughs> um, we have some companies in Europe that have expressed interest. Um, Yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, so um, it, it, to be a, a volunteer leader, you have to be a tiered member of, of Open Compute. Um, to participate, you, can, you don't have to be. Uh, anybody can participate. Um, but our volunteer leadership comes from our, our tiered members. So it's kind of a double-edged sword, you know, to be a tiered, to, you know, a lot of benefits from being a tiered member, but they have to pay back, and this is their opportunity to pay back, so we... We kind of hold that in reserve that they get they those spots are held for them to 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 be part of that. So. Yeah. So we're um, uh, we have kind of set aside. I, I think we set aside about an hour in Amsterdam. Um, Steve doesn't know this, but uh, I'll <laughs> I'll let you know. Um, so one of the things that we did. Um, is is we we're trying to coordinate travel so that if you you know if you have to travel somewhere that you can you know get a lot done uh, and so um, uh, and so the week before our summit is the open network uh, summit um, for the few days right before uh, and, it, and we made sure that there was something to do on the weekend so um, Munich scheduled Oktoberfest for that weekend um, just in case. Um, and then come back on Monday to Amsterdam. It's a very easy flight back. Um, Monday and Tuesday with OCP, and then Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, uh, Open Power Summit is being held in the same location. And um, because there's actually a lot of overlap with Open Power, um, and particular, particularly with GPUs and, and some of the, the, the architecture there, we're actually having discussions with the, um, the director of the Open Power um, a group and suggested that we set aside time on Wednesday um, to actually have a, a deeper discussion and so, you know some some actual time to sit down and work on some of this stuff. Um, so that's very preliminary, Steve. Um, I just got an email back from Hugh last night. I get or yesterday said, "Yep, let's cue that up." So um, he's going to sound. He's going to share that with his board. And his community and, and sense the interest, um, and obviously they they're doing the same thing. There's some think topics that that they're interested. Open power uh, community is interested in attending on Monday and Tuesday, and then and so we're thinking Wednesday we may have, you know, we can take take advantage of their their space and yeah. you know use get a couple hours to set aside. So because we our our schedule is completely booked on on Monday and Tuesday. So. We don't have any time left. Uh, so that's our next opportunity. 
Um, there's a meeting that, that Steve has already set up um, beginning in two weeks. We've already set up a, a wiki page. And we've already drafted uh, a charter for this. Um, and really, uh, hold on for a minute, kill that. Um, and we're really looking for volunteer leaders for like all three of those. Um, and, and so I mentioned, you know, that a lot of interest in Asia, uh, Europe. Um, based on who we have volunteer uh, and, and what the makeup of those groups are, we'll, we'll probably schedule additional meetings um, that works well with that, that particular time zone. You know, so, for example, if, if immersion ends up being really popular in Asia, we'll probably set something up uh, that, that works for the Asia time zone. So um, it may mean that, you know, somebody's going to have to make a really early or, or potentially late, late night call for some of those meetings. Um, wherever possible, we'll try to have, uh, we'd like to have at least uh, two people so we have co-leads on this. Um, and obviously, Steve and I'll, I'll be a you know a part of that. Um, I just had a quick question. It says call details are available here. Do you have a, do you have a oh, yeah. click on the link or something? Yes. Um, so that it's, it, they're published now on the OCP website. So if you go to Open Compute Project, um, calendars. yeah, under calendars, and then look on the rack and power calendar. Uh, you'll see you'll see these set up, and so you can you can get the specific details there. This is just this is just a link that'll take you to that calendar. It's a go to meeting, so you'll just have to register for it. And once you register, then you'll get you know the series uh, on your calendar, whether it's Outlook or you know Google Calendar, whatever you use. Actually, that brings up a good point. Um, if, if you are interested in attending any of the project meetings. Um, you know, go to the uh, opencompute.org uh, projects, um, go to the calendar, and, um, and you know, again, once you register for any one of those meetings, you get the whole series. So. And then the mailing list that's given there, the link there, um, any agenda items that are discussed, um, any kind of uh, minutes from the meeting, um, you know, Steve or Bill or whoever the, the project lead would be, on the mailing list so that you would get an update in case there are changes. And then the wiki will have all of the reports from the call. So if you can't not make it for any reason, you can always go back and listen to it. So uh, I'd love to hear your comments about or your thoughts on, on this activity. I know, how important is it? Are you interested in working on it? <laughs> <laughs> Love to hear your feedback. Is it needed or should we just drop it? <laughs> From a facility uh, project perspective, it would be really cool to be able to say, you know, whatever category of rack we need to feed it with certain water flow, mm -hmm. volume, and delta T. Take it, take it from there, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and you know, that'd be great to start setting up some standards around that. So you think having, you know, establishing those boundary conditions yeah. is, a, is a great thing. Yeah, yeah. 
So once we do that, I mean, do we, is there anything else we have to do on the facility side? Well, like you said, if we know a maximum water temperature that you can feed a rack. And Volume, it. delta T. Yeah, then the whole mechanical could go, could go away, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah, Andy. Does this work? Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, we showed um, we showed inline cooling at Cbit. Um, you know, we're not we're not an end user, of course. Uh, we're a manufacturer and a supplier, but we showed it bolted onto an open compute rack, and we had a lot of interest from end users and a lot of inquiries. I know Steve's already said that at the last OCP show, it was one of the biggest inquiry mm -hmm. was cooling, with especially with GPUs you know, growing in um, deployment. So. Yeah, certainly from Cbit in Europe, we see uh, the in we showed an inline and a, and a DX system. It was uh, it was a lot of interest on an OCP. Yeah. Okay. So. All right. Yeah, that's good feedback. Um, so the kind of the other thing we need to do is uh, start looking at the workflows and see if we can start. Uh, I guess focusing on the, you know, what are those the right workflows that we want to set up? Yeah, um, so I we. Think that's some of the next. Let's see what else we got. Yeah, you want to talk to those real quick? The different workflows, potential workflows. Like these are all open for discussion. Yeah, so, um, you know, one of the things that we have to do, uh, it are suggested that we do, is, is look at, you know, within those three groups, um, you know, what is it that we can harmonize um, uh, to, you know, to, to, you know, work on a, a common solution. So there's some suggestions that Steve has, um, and, and, you know, these are only suggestions. Is there... Um, things that we should add to this list that you can think of. Um, so the first one is, um, you know, if you, if you think about IT equipment, um, you, you, we don't want to be too prescriptive on you know, the, on how you actually design the equipment and, and attach cold plates. I think there's actually opportunities to be innovative there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so our thinking is that we treat the, you know, the server sled um, as kind of a black box and simply say, hey, at, at the edge of that box, maybe it's in the back, um, you know, we, we have a, an area to connect, um, you know, cooling lines on it and then specify the parameters around those cooling lines. Mm -hmm. How much can be extracted? What type of water flows? You know, what type of connectors that we need? Um, and and then uh, and it may get, come into how you know what we need to you know control it through, um, you know, uh, an API for example. Is there any additional information we need to, need to provide? So that could be another workflow is is the you know the the embedded firmware that goes hand in hand with liquid cooling. Um, but our, our thought is treat it as a black box and, and we'll look at the interface point. So one is on the back of the IT equipment. Yeah. And I guess I'm being presumptuous to say it's on the back. It, is, it doesn't necessarily have to be. Sure, but to be. Um, the other is, uh, um, is, is actually at the rack itself. And so we could have another touch point between the rack and the facility. So think about what that touch point would look like. Is there opportunities to create standards there? Um, and then how would we spec out what the rack does, the function of the facility versus the function of the rack? Does it entail recirculation pumps or manifolds or capacities or, again, delta T's associated with that, that you know, heat exchange? If, in fact, there's heat exchange that occurs there. So um, that would be a potential another, uh, you know, workflow. Um, on the immersion side, I gave the example of, of IT gear um, you know, simply just unpackaging the IT gear so that you get, you know, better, you know, power densities may be an opportunity, um, you know, so we can look at that and say, is, it, is there simple ways to unpackage it and, you know, provide, uh, you know, the, the proper handling to, to put that into a tank uh, and service it. Um, uh, similarly, management protocols, I think those apply to all, you know, all three solutions. Sure. 
Um, and then again on the facility side, um, you know, the idea would be that, uh, you know, regardless of the solution provider that's providing the emergent solution, that we ought to have a common interface to the facilities mm -hmm. and an expectation around that investment in the facility, because that investment is a, is a long-term and 20-year life, right? Um, so, what, you know, what type of water flows you need, what type of, of um, you know, do you need a chiller? Can you get away with a, a dry cooler? Um, you know, what kind of flow rates and delta Ts and, and uh, pressure deltas that you want to, um, you know, provide for at the edge of the, between the rack and, and the facility. So that would be another workflow. So, I mean, these are just our recommendations, right, to the community, right? So we're basically looking to you guys, you know, what, what else are we missing, right? What else needs to be included in these um, so we can, start, we can start defining kind of the scope of some of this work um, kind of as our first step. I think you need to add safety and safety, safety certifications there. Okay. Pumping a lot of water and getting a leak in a 50 kilowatt rack is not going to be very, sure. very good. No, that's good. Did you get that, Caleb? All right. Anything else you guys see? I mean, there's got to be lots of other stuff that we don't have covered up here. Another uh, one is impacts on uh, hot swapping of servers. Uh, related to what? The if a server goes down, remove you know, disconnecting it from the from the coolant and being able to move it aside without having any uh, any issues. Okay. So just and then the other thing would be serviceability, um, <coughs> seismic, or vibration, on the impacts of the connections. Okay. Over time. Okay. So that would be a specific requirement for the interconnects, and probably for the immersion as well, right? Are yeah. there seismic requirements, and what would those be? So that's good. That's great. What else? There's got to be lots of other stuff. Maybe not Robert? a requirement, but an understanding of weight. Weight. Okay. Weight and how that would impact, uh, it's certainly, it's certainly a, a big one. What facility you can go into. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's good. And, and not only the rack itself, but the supporting water piping. And yeah, all of that, right? Even the, even the liquid itself is uh, significant, whether it's immersion or, or the, the cold plate solutions. Both of that, that's a significant amount of weight. Yeah. I guess that, that really does scale weight, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> A lot. It's okay. That that's good. Would you say fourteen hundred kilograms? We'll blow right through that <laughs> number. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. Which I mean, that's good to know, right? Then you start setting up setting up yeah. requirements around around that as well. So, is there a different technology that deserves its own yeah. workflow, right? So we've got two of them up here. Um, you'd also mentioned uh, compressed air as a workflow potentially. Or is there anybody that sees value in that particular workflow? Uh, system that don't actually involve electric fueling interacting with your hardware in any way, shape, or form. Such as? Uh, well, our company, ABC Technologies, has a technology that does that called thermal rail. Sure, yes. Sure. Yeah, exactly right. So that what? particular one has a, has a, if I remember correctly, you've got the IT box, and then there's a uh, a rail on the side that has liquid coolant flowing through that. So rather mm -hmm. than having it in the back, it, it runs out through the through kind of the dead space on the side of the rack. And you would you would you treat that as a as a separate work stream? Or would you treat it as like a separate technology? Um, yeah, I mean uh, that particular one, right, like a lot of these, I believe is a, a proprietary solution, right? If there's only one one company that makes it, and so there's only mm -hmm. one form factor for that. So you could set up, uh, I mean, a specification for you know the IT gear and how it connects to Open Rail, but you know the goal would be to have three or four companies that are capable of delivering an Open Rail style solution. So if we could get multiple companies that are interested in doing that, then yeah, we would definitely want to set up the interfaces between open rail and the rack and open rail and the IT gear. So, so we'd have lots of companies doing that. Um, so I think that would be a good suggestion if, if, that's, if that's going to be an open 
right, right, if we can get multiple, multiple suppliers capable of delivering that style of solution, then yeah, definitely. Um, I don't know, I don't know, does anybody know if there's more than one company doing an open, uh, uh, that rail style thermal sink? Okay, same, same idea though, okay. Do you have something, Andy? Direct immersion and immersion, but what about uh, indirect cooling? Um, there's a whole, there's whole infrastructure out there for cooling. So whether or not you want to approach that, so anything from all containment that fits the standard 19-inch enclosures, which isn't a, isn't a part of OCP right now, right the way through to inline cooling, um, as we showed at CBIT, um, DX-type cooling, so using refrigerants. So it's outside of the rack, but it's cooling mm -hmm. the, the colo or the, or the room, et cetera, in a larger space, as opposed to a very localized cooling at a chip level or a, or a server level, maybe. And most of the manufacturers here probably all have, all have that anyway, just, just haven't adopted it for OCP. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, so what, let's ask that question, right? There, there's, there, there's definitely lots of companies out there that have those solutions already, um, again, but not necessarily an OCP version of that. Right. Is there well, interest from the community kind of setting up standards around that um, so that we can convert some of the existing 19-inch solutions to uh, OCP form factors, kind of like we were doing with uh, the power stuff where you can put it in a 19 or a 21. So it sounds like... So I would suggest joining the data center facility call. Uh, <laughs> okay. Because there has been discussion definitely like, you know, hey, in the, in the data center facility call, uh, there definitely has been discussions on, uh, like the COLO guidelines, you know, what's an optimum, right? Containment, yeah. hot all containment, hard floor, you know, things like that. And so if, uh, if the community does start to uh, kind of group around a certain reference design or something like that, I think it'd be, it'd be great. So uh, once a month on the project calendar, call, call in. <laughs> Yeah, I think as we I think as we go forward, right, as some of this stuff gets defined, all those interfaces between data center project and and this one are going to have to. There's going to have to be some cross pollination between those two projects to make sure that uh, everything that we're doing is in is in sync with each other. Absolutely. So, Steve, we you know we could have um, you know new ideas or new approaches to this come up, um, similar to the one that Andy just mentioned. Um, is that something that we should run through the, the, the rack and power uh, calls and, uh, and see whether or not it, it, you know, we want to spawn a separate work, work group for that? Yeah, that seems like a reasonable first start, first, right? Yeah. As we add additional scope, right, run that through the rack and power and, and, and right. decide what, what the scope of that work is and make sure we've got the infrastructure set up to... Yeah. Uh, meet whatever goal that that happens to be. If right. it's something simple enough, we can put it under an uh, existing workflow. That's great. If not, then we may need to spawn off. Yeah. And who knows what to, to go yeah. deliver so, that. So. so the three that the three that we initially chose was based on you know feedback from the industry that there was opportunity to collaborate and uh, and drive you know adoption of the technology. So those we that was the reason we chose those three. But it's certainly not limited to that. Yep. So, um, on if I remember correctly, on one of the previous slides, uh, for immersion, it listed both single phase and two phase. I'm curious to know for the cold plate technology, is that specific only to single phase, or does that include both single phase and two phase coolants? I thought it only applied to immersion. Uh, you know, the type of material he used, whether he used a you know, a, a fluorinate material versus, uh, you know, versus a mineral oil. Um, so I think it, I think it just applies to immersion. But again, I may be wrong, and, and I'll leave it up to the engineers to figure that out. But, um, so I would assume that we could expand it to that if it makes sense, right? Yeah, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Right? absolutely. Yeah, the, yeah. yeah, the point of this the discussions right now is to, to kind of decide what that initial scope is, what, what needs to be included and, and not for those initial, initial topics.
Yeah, absolutely. And uh, there's already quite a bit of information that's already been developed um, around this. Um, so it's not necessarily something that we would necessarily have to go off and create. Um, I'm pretty sure there's some stuff from ASTM and... Yeah, and, so uh, that, actually that brings up... Ray, rather, sorry. That's already... Yeah. Well, so um, harmonization of um, direct cold plate technology was actually started uh, by Lawrence Berkeley Labs um, in conjunction with um, probably half a dozen companies. Um, Dale Sartor uh, at, at Lawrence Berkeley started this effort about two years ago. Um, and it's, uh, they've done a lot of that work and um, we've, um, in one of our decisions that, that in decision in making this a project, um, you know, we reached out and talked to Dale and um, tried to understand the, you know, the problems that he ran into in running that group. And, and it really comes down to trying to build a bigger, broader community that was a global in nature. And, um, and so he welcomed our involvement. In fact, he said, you know, you can, you know, have everything we've done. Uh, and, and Dale would actually like to be a part of it. And he's, um, you know, he's actually considering whether or not um, he serves in one of those roles as a, as a volunteer leader. Um, and so uh, one of the things that they did in their initial spec uh, or guideline was to look at the material, uh, you know, material issues, right, and recommendations there. So that group will have a starting point um, with some of the material that, that's already been developed. So. Um, that those guidelines were put together with the help of um, uh, people, engineers from um, you know, Facebook, Microsoft, Intel, uh, Baidu. Um, there was Ten Tencent, Alibaba. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, so good point. I mean, that's uh, and and actually, I think the the topics that they identified. Um, are probably good starting points. So there is some work that's already started um, to get to get this group going. Um, yeah, and and by the way, uh, we're not trying to hijack their project. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, John He uh, uh, from Intel uh, participated and contributed quite a bit. Um, I've actually reached out to John and uh, invited him. He can't be here today. Um, he wanted to be here with his team. I'm very much interested, in, and uh, you know, he's he may be interested in, in being a co-lead on this. So, um, you know, we we know that that we're we're trying to engage with with the folks. Um, you know, we, we we've talked to Baidu uh, as well, and and they're clearly interested. Um, I in in April I met with um, Binghua, the the chairperson of ODCC, and sat down and, and met with ODCC and asked what we could be doing together. Um, as an organization, as the two organizations. Um, they had, he identified liquid cooling as, as one of those areas. Um, and so when we formalized and got board approval to launch this, uh, the first email I sent was back to Benoit to say, hey, by the way, we, we went ahead and launched it. And uh, about 30 minutes later, he returned and said, I got three engineers that'll work on it. So, um, you know, so we're, in, and, and some of those were already engaged in, uh, you know, in, in the work that, that Dale started at, at Lawrence Berkeley. So um, we, we got a lot of, we're trying to bring everybody together to, to work on this. So, yeah, definitely material, what yeah. materials is definitely within the scope, definitely. Um, myself, I work at Baidu, so uh, I'm familiar with Dale. I was gonna bring up oh. uh, the work that he's done because I'm part of the organization, but I'm also working on um, immersion cooling, and I, I know of a company that's um, going to be interested in starting up something for immersion. So I'll, uh, the reason I was asking for the contact information was I, I was going to, he's in the Netherlands, so I was going to try to send him some information. This is a person that'd be interested in immersion? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah, so the, yeah, probably the easiest, the, the, sorry. The, probably the easiest thing to do is just send them the link for the, the uh, advanced cooling mailing list. Because once you're on there, every, all this other stuff will, will constantly be fed to you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sure. 
Uh, by the way, was, was your name given to us? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I'm trying, to put, I'm trying to put names and faces together, so. Uh. Um, not familiar enough with the materials being used as coolants or the, for, for immersion, but uh, I think we should have a look at the environmental impacts like Rojas and all that once we begin using whatever is used with EU restrictions being tighter every year and all that, you know, it might be a block for the market or something. Yeah, I think that's imperative we do that. I think we have to look at um, sustainability um, and, uh, and, you know, and serviceability. So, absolutely. And I think that's one of the things that, we, you know, that the immersion group has to look at is the type of material um, and the impact it has on um, the ozone, the ozone depletion factors. So anything else uh, anybody can think of that needs to be included in the, like kind of the initial scoping of these projects? Or anything related to kind of the the written scope of what's inside and what's outside of scope that's not appropriate or missing. Okay. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. Um, so I guess the the next the, kind of the next steps, right, will be setting up the or, or joining us for the uh, the twice a month meetings starting in, in August 15th, I believe is what it was. And we'll, we'll take it from there. So I would love to see, um, you know, a draft of guidelines from the groups come out prior to the March meeting. Well, yeah. March we'll, summer. We'll sure. I was hoping we might have a little something before. Uh, well, that'd be great if we had some for <laughs> Amsterdam, but uh, I'm actually thinking that we're, we have enough runway here that uh, it'd be great if we, you know, not only had guidelines published, but we actually had some suppliers that wanted to, um, you know, demonstrate, um, you know, potential oh. solutions. Yeah, yeah. And I was that. hoping we had, might have something preliminary, right, that we could review. Yeah, yeah. Maybe not finalized, but at least some some stuff, some progress made, and then, uh, yeah, yeah, something that we can actually see, maybe some hardware based on that, um, yeah, at Summit uh, next spring. All right. Six months, right? Yeah. A little, a little more. A little more than little that. More. Eight months, no See, problem. Be easy. <laughs> 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 All right. Uh, well, this, so this is the last topic that we had today. Um, is Archana in here somewhere? She had to leave. Sure. Oh, okay, yeah. okay, great. Um, I don't know if there's anything um, um, the foundation wants to say kind of as we wrap things up for the day. No. Um, <laughs> Well, first off, let's, so, so we have a few more minutes yeah. here. Um, so at the beginning, there was a show of hands on um, you know folks that had not attended a, a works, uh, you know works. Uh, well, what do we call these workshops? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I got I got to warn you. I, I was in Asia all last week, so I'm still trying to adjust my time. So I'm kind of hitting the wall here about two o'clock. Anyway, um, so what did you guys think of the workshop? Was it worth your time? Was it informative? Um, do you want to be a part of this? I'd just love to get your feedback and, um, you know, make, make sure that we're using your time wisely, um, that you see value in being a part of this community, um, that you see how your company uh, and you, the work that you're doing day to day, you know, fits into this and, and how can you, you know, take this back and apply it, um, you know, within your company to Know, speed up innovation and speed up uh, adoption. Yeah. Oh, good. Okay. 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 Good. Good. Any questions? Anything? You can open it and ask us anything. Wow. We didn't do that good a job. <laughs> Okay. Yeah.
glad to hear that. All right. So case. I got we got one more. So we um, we talked. You know, we we spent some time vetting out whether or not it made sense to do advanced cooling. Is there something on the horizon that we should that we all of us should work on? Um, you know, a, a, a technology. So you, you know, think about that. Um, you know, let's talk about it in the monthly calls. Um, you know, we try to vet this out, you know, not, we don't want to have a knee-jerk reaction and go create another project for the sake of, of doing that. We like to vet things out, um, make sure that we have, you know, lots of different companies that, that share that same problem or same opportunity. So um, think about that. Feel free to talk to any of us. Um, okay. That's it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Good job, Steve.